I mean, a lot of business leaders say that that failure is just you know such a part of success that <laughs> so um, it it seems counterintuitive though if if you know for someone to hate losing <laughs> to want to keep going failure after failure with their their business because that that in the end I think it is kind of what it takes right is to just just keep going after and keep sticking it out there and trying more and more difficult things and, and failing at more difficult things too. Right. I, t I tell people all the time, I was a little bit of a loser in high school and uh, <laughs> the constant rejection whenever I ask girls out really set me up for a life of entrepreneurship. So <laughs> oh, nice. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's, um, I think it's important. And I think that when, if you're in business, if you're um, sales, entrepreneurship, whatever the case may be, um, specifically in that context, the thing that a lot of people have to realize is that you're going to fail no matter what. You know, the mm -hmm. question is, are you going to fail often and on purpose, driving after a goal that you have, or are you just going to fail because you're just trying to stay comfortable, not cause any waves, and that in of itself is what I call coasting, right? If we're just trying to maintain, we think, you know, hey, I'm comfortable right now. I'm not saying everything's perfect, but you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's coasting through life. Well, the funny thing about coasting, if you think about it in the context of a car, you can't coast unless you're going slightly downhill. And that's what I think ends up happening. We talk about it in business all the time. You're either growing or you're dying. Yeah, well, yeah. I think even if you're going downhill, you're still going to fall apart eventually. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, and, and eventually it just gets harder and harder and harder because you're going faster and faster and faster. So it's harder to reverse that. So, you know, I, I just look at it as, you know, people are like, well, I just, I'm not a goal oriented person. I'm scared of failure. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. You're going to fail one way or the other, you know, it just comes yeah. back to that. Choose your hard thing. Again, yeah, yeah, another yeah. cliche it's really <laughs> because it's true. I want more people to be able to have that because I think we live in a world nowadays to where society, society thrives off of our four primary resources, which is our time, energy, money, and attention. And society is not inherently like some bad thing, right? Society mm -hmm. is just a machine, sure. but it's a machine that thrives on those four resources. So it will take mm -hmm. as much of those things from you as you give it. And if you, and they're very good at it, good these point. things, right here these are yeah. fine tuned to hack every little dopamine center in our brain right. as much as our time energy money and attention as it can take mm -hmm. and again there's nothing inherently evil about this device or or the the businesses behind it that are trying to get you to shop with them or whatever mm -hmm. but that's what i think has ended up happening to a lot of people i think we have a purpose crisis right now to mm -hmm. where people yeah. are looking for meaning People are looking for significance. We are living in one yeah. of the best, forget what the media says right now, right? The media wants you to believe everything's terrible. It's because it's an election year. <laughs> life's, life's never been better. Globally, especially, mm -hmm. life's never been better. I'm not saying things mm -hmm. are a little hard right now. Sure, buying a house was easier 20 years ago, but globally, life's never been better in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. And that's not me being an optimist. That's just me being realistic. A lot of people don't know this, right. but India didn't even have uh, I think it was less than 33% uh, of their toilets had an actual toilet as of like 15 years ago. Mm. So that's over a billion people right. that are dealing with very unsanitary conditions in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 15 years later, it's like 98% of them have toilets. Wow. Yeah, It's a weird stat, but it just goes to show right. you that life is getting better. But I think we're at a point now mm. to where the great war that we have to fight is not necessarily with the obvious exclusion of places where there actually is war, but specifically for us in the States, the great war that we have to fight is not one of an external enemy. It's an internal one. And mm -hmm. I think you see that in depression rates in suicide mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. And I truly believe that creating a why statement and starting to live that out is as close to a silver bullet as you can get. So,
Great. Well, welcome, everybody, uh, to another episode of Define Your Purpose. And, um, you know, purpose is the birthplace of ideas. And joining me today from um, Gainesville, Florida, Mr. Stephen Corson. He's a executive coach and business leader. Um, th thanks for taking the time, Stephen. Appreciate it. Happy to be here, Carl. So uh, I, I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit about um, mindset. You know, I, I found this quote that kind of sticks with me. It's by Charles Bukowski, and it's, the problem with the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts while the stupid ones are full of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> No, it's mindset is a cliche, right? I mean, let's just call it what it is. I mean, you, you hear all the great sports coaches talk about it, the athletes, oh, it's your mindset. You know, you hear it in business all the time. I was in sales for 14 years. I have my own business, so still technically in sales. Um, I, I like to argue that everybody's in sales, right? If you're a single guy, guess what? You're trying to sell some girl that of the other 4 billion guys on the planet, you're the one she should end up with. So, you know, we're all in sales at some, at some level, but, um, but yeah, mindset's a cliche, but the funny thing about cliches mm -hmm. is that they're generally true. And, um, you know, the thing that I have found in my life that has, um, continued to help me level up is going back to what my mindset is because we're human and to human is to air. And you may have a really good mindset for a month, but guess mm -hmm. what? That can shift pretty quickly, can it? And, you know, it's, uh, there's actually a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. It's sitting right over here on my desk. Uh, it has to be the most underrated book um, around success that I think I've ever read personally. So I highly recommend people checking it out. But okay. one of the things that's really interesting that she talks about in there is that mindset really has nothing to do with talent. And, you know, she at, it gives a lot of different stories, but there is an example of this violin prodigy. And I think they were going to Juilliard, the very, uh, you know, prestigious uh, musical college. And uh, she talked about how everybody there was a violinist prodigy. So just, you know, just incredible talents at what they did. Mm -hmm. But then through going through studies, there was certain ones that just by the way that they talked limited themselves to what potential they could reach. And I just thought that was fascinating because, you know, at the end of the day, can you, can, with the right mindset, could I be in the NBA? No, <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't born like LeBron James. I'm not six, eight, um, you know, shredded fast twitch muscles, like all this other stuff. I, I you know, it, I don't even know if I could have made a D1 college. Maybe, maybe a D1 college, right? But at, my mindset isn't going to fix that. So is there a cap on our potential? Sure. But is it way higher than anything that we believe it could be for ourselves? I think it's totally true. I think that 99% of people on this planet are probably underperforming at something. Uh, and it's strictly due to mindset. So, so yeah. I, uh, I love the quote that you said. And uh, like I said, for all those out there, they're like, oh gosh, are we talking about mindset again? I would just say, <laughs> yeah, we're talking about mindset again. Look, if all the great athletes of the world, all the great coaches of the world, all the great business leaders of the world, if they all talk about mindset, maybe we should pay a little attention to it. Yeah, yeah, true, true. So, I mean, it's amazing. You, you've done a lot of um, great speaking too, uh, as far as TEDx and all. Um, yep. How, how did you get started in, in all this? Um, I mean, did you just go to business school and and uh, <laughs> you were a prodigy? <laughs> Man, let me tell you something. The way that I ended up with, with TEDx, the only thing I'm a prodigy at is just <laughs> running into hard walls <laughs> and being so damn stubborn uh, <laughs> to not walk away from and just figure a way through whether it's the best way or not. Um, yeah, there's that old saying, uh, you know, if you're going to be if you're going to be stupid, you better be tough. That's probably a nice alignment with how my life has gone. Um, I am not a super intelligent person, which should encourage a lot of people. But the one superpower that I do have 
it, uh, well, I would say I have two superpowers. My first superpower is I have a love for reading. And because of that, um, I, I love, and, and a lot of this came from values that my parents, my dad specifically put in me, mm-hmm. is I love being in rooms or around people that are better than me at something. And that's not hard to mm-hmm. find, you know, but it, 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 I'm just a constant student and, you know, I love reading books. And the reality is, you know, some people look at a $20 book and they go, okay, $20, it's 300 pages, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I got to find time for that. I look at that book and I go, man, $20 to pick the brain of somebody who's incredibly successful at this thing. Like right. I would, it, yeah. would I pay $20 to go to lunch with this person and ask them these questions? Absolutely. Well, here it is in black and yeah. white form. So I have a different mindset around books. And then the other thing I would say around books that I think can help a lot of people with their mindset shift in it is again, $20 book. I don't look at these books that I'm reading and I'm, and I'm talking specifically about um, nonfiction books right now, but I do believe that there's a lot of benefits to fiction. So I recommend that too. But specifically with nonfiction, the th- what I, my objective when I'm reading a book is, is there just one piece of advice in this book that I could take away and implement in my life that is worth more than $20. And and with that mindset, I don't really read a lot of books that uh, end up wasting my time because normally there's one thing I can take away from this pretty smart person at whatever it is they do. So that would be the first superpower I have, I would say is, you know, is that hunger for knowledge and, and specifically in reading. And then the second superpower that I have is just, I, hate losing. (laughs) It is just a ingrained thing in me. And I view so many things in my life through this dichotomy of winning and losing. And I'm sure some therapist out here is listening to this screaming. That's not healthy. It's probably not, but hey, (laughs) it's it's working out okay for me so far. But I mean, I even my marriage um, with my wife, I look at it and I go, did I win in my marriage today? Um, Did I speak her love language? Did I Um, text her for no reason and just say, I hope you're having a great day. You know, different things like that. Did I clean the dishes in the sink, even though I don't want to do it so she doesn't have to do it when she gets home? If I can't check that box off at least once a day, then I lost in my marriage that day. So it's like this, this dichotomy of just constant winning and losing success and failure I live with on a daily basis. And that superpower of just the drive to win, the, the absolute hate that I have for losing, I think is the other thing that's really kind of got me where I am. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, my background is nothing special. I grew up lower middle class family. Dad made $35,000 a year. Mom stayed home with the five kids. I was the oldest of the five. First one in my family to ever go to college. Um, You know, got a degree Mm -hmm. in family and community sciences because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I w- did start out pre-med, but I knew I wasn't smart enough or had the desire to be in school for another 12 years. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> fell into sales because, mm-hmm. hey, why not? Sounded fun. Did great in that for 14 years. Quit my job two years ago to start doing this full time. Started doing it part time five years ago. So, yeah, my journey is a great. bunch of just taking it one wall after the other <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and figuring right. out a way up, over, around or through it. So. Yeah. I mean, a lot of business leaders say that that failure is just, you know, such a part of success that <laughs> so um, it, it seems counterintuitive, though, if, if, you know, for someone to hate losing, <laughs> to want to keep going failure after failure with their, their business, because that, that in the end, I think it is kind of what it takes, right, is to just just keep going after and keep sticking it out there and trying more and more difficult things and, and failing at more difficult things too. Right. I, t- I tell people all the time, I was a little bit of a loser in high school and uh, <laughs> the constant rejection when I ever, I asked girls out really set me up for a life of entrepreneurship. So <laughs> oh, nice. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's, um, I think it's important. And I think that when, If you're in business, if you're um, sales, entrepreneurship, whatever the case may be, um, specifically in that context, 
the thing that a lot of people have to realize is that you're going to fail no matter what. You know, the question is, are you going to fail often and on purpose driving after a goal that you have, or are you just going to fail because you're just trying to stay comfortable, not cause any waves. And that in of itself is what I call coasting, right? If we're just trying to maintain, we think, you know, Hey, I'm comfortable right now. Not saying everything's perfect, but you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's coasting through life. Well, the funny thing about coasting, if you think about it in the context of a car, you can't coast unless you're going slightly downhill. And that's what I think ends up happening. We talk about it in business all the time. You're either growing or you're dying. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think even if you're going downhill, you're still going to fall apart eventually. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, and, and eventually it just gets harder and harder and harder because you're going faster and faster and faster. So it's harder to reverse that. So, you know, I, I just look at it as, you know, people are like, well, I just, I'm not a goal oriented person. I'm scared of failure. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. You're going to fail one way or the other. You know, it just comes yeah. back to that. Choose your hard thing. Again, yeah, yeah, another yeah. cliche it's really <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. So um, what made you want to start in your, your business and, and go out working for yourself at, at the time that you did? Yeah, I mean, this will line up great with uh, the, the, the purpose of your podcast, right? Talking about purpose. Um, mm -hmm. It's what I call a why statement, you know, which is pretty mm -hmm. much, you know, you could literally redefine that as a purpose statement. And um, about seven years ago, no, 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 it was longer than that. It was, I'm sorry, it was 11 years ago that I did this for the first time. I had learned about strategy because I was working with a lot of management consultants. We were doing consulting with Fortune 500 companies at the C-suite. And I was listening to them talk about strategy. And uh, there's four phases to strategy, destination, starting point, journey, and checkpoints. So it doesn't matter if it's a business strategy, battle strategy, whatever. They all follow those four phases. And I thought to myself one time after hearing this talk for the umpteenth time, you know, from one of these super smart analysts, I was like, I should start doing that with my own life. Like, that's actually a pretty good idea, you know? <laughs> so I created these seven steps that I slowly refined over the years to help me create these, a, 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 what I call now the lifestyle design strategy. And, you know, what ended up happening was after doing that for about four years, uh, I started seeing such insane results in my life that other people were noticing and started asking me. And I'll never forget when it really clicked that I was doing something so drastically different. Uh, I would hit the top sales goal every single year in my career. And mm -hmm. we would go to this thing called Winter Circle. That was, you know, the top, you know, sales trip or whatever. And there was a small group of us that all kind of knew each other. We didn't work in the same building. You know, we were in different parts of the country or whatever. Um, but we were all there every year. And so we were like, ah, yeah, like we just knew we, you know, we had it figured out. Well, one day I'm sitting, <clears throat> this is probably my fourth winter circle. I'm sitting at the table with these people and we're all talking. And one of the girls looks at me and she goes, what are you doing so different? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like you were, you did just as well as I did. We're all at the big trip. Like, what do you mean? And she goes, no, no, no. She goes, I'm working every night till like 7 p.m. And sometimes on the weekends. She's like, you log out every day at five and I can never get you on the weekends if I'm pinging you or something. Like you, you're never on. And I go, well, yeah, aren't you? And she's like, no, I'm working like 70 hours a week to get the same result that you are working 40 hours a week. I was like, actually, it's probably like 32, but whatever. <laughs> and then everybody at the table was like, yeah, man, what are you doing? And I didn't notice that it was making such a big difference. But really what I realized was by having a strategy, it was enabling me not just to figure out what I should do, but it was just as importantly helping me figure out what I should not do. And a lot of times in entrepreneurship, in yeah. business, there's a lot of time wasters out there and some of them are optional and some of them aren't. Everybody has been a part of a meeting where we're all sitting there going, dear Lord, this could have been an email, <laughs> right? Sure. Sometimes you got to be there, right? Other times those can end up being optional, you know, and, and we don't check that. So there were just certain things that I was doing. And as I got into that, basically people started asking me to coach them. They're like, show me what you're doing. So that's how I kind of backwards fell into coaching, did nice. it for 
five years, got to the point to where I was like, you know, I've done the business thing. This has been great, but I've got an entrepreneurial itch I want to scratch. My purpose, my why statement is to love God, cherish my family, help others, uh, uh, serve others, I'm sorry, and have fun while doing it. Well, I <laughs> was getting to the point in my career to where they were trying to promote me. It was going to be golden handcuffs. I was going to be making $400,000 a year, stock options, RSUs, all these other things. And I was like, that money is going to be really hard to walk away from. And I'm miserable doing this. This is not aligning with my why statement. This is not aligning with my purpose. And I think there's a real power in having a purpose statement and having a why statement because it's not meant to be a destination. It's meant to be a North star. It's basically a statement of your values. And when you have that written down and you can say it like I can, and like the people that I coach, they can say their why statement. It's just a simple sentence. Again, it sounds kind of cliche, but when you live that, it will cause you to make some drastic life changes. And yeah. I am so really? happy that I turned down the money. And I'm so yeah. happy that I decided to do this because now I'm living a life of significance and meaning because yeah. I'm living within that purpose. And that's why I think it's just so important. I want more people to be able to have that because I think we live in a world nowadays to where society, society thrives off of our four primary resources, which is our time, energy, money, and attention. And society is not inherently like some bad thing, right? Society mm -hmm. is just a machine, sure. but it's a machine that thrives on those four resources. So it will take mm -hmm. as much of those things from you as you give it. And if you, and they're very good at it, good these point. things mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. here, these are yeah. fine tuned to hack every little dopamine center in our brain, right. as much as our time, energy, money, and attention as it can take. Mm -hmm. And again, there's nothing inherently evil about this device or, or the, the businesses behind it that are trying to get you to shop with them or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's what I think has ended up happening to a lot of people. I think we have a purpose crisis right now to mm -hmm. where people yeah. are looking for meaning. People are looking for significance. We are living in one yeah. of the best, forget what the media says right now, right? The media wants you to believe everything's terrible. It's because it's an election year. <laughs> life's, life's never been better. Globally, especially, mm -hmm. life's never been better. I'm not saying things mm -hmm. are a little hard right now. Sure, buying a house was easier 20 years ago. But globally, life's never been better in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. And that's not me being an optimist. That's just me being realistic. A lot of people don't know this, but India didn't even have, uh, I think it was less than... 33% uh, of their toilets had an actual toilet as of like 15 years ago. Mm. So that's over a billion people right. that are dealing with very unsanitary conditions in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 15 years later, it's like 98% of them have toilets. Wow. Yeah, It's a weird stat, but it just goes to show right. you that life is getting better. But I think we're at a point now mm. to where the great war that we have to fight is not necessarily with the obvious exclusion of places where there actually is war, but specifically for us in the States, the great war that we have to fight is not one of an external enemy, it's an internal one. And mm -hmm. I think you see that in depression rates, in suicide, mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. And I truly believe that creating a why statement and starting to live that out is as close to a silver bullet as you can get. So yeah. I said a lot there, sorry. Told you I could <laughs> go on forever about this stuff. I'm passionate about it, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's that's, uh, great. that's what I believe about that stuff. Yeah, I I, I love that. That's great. I, I totally agree with you too. And it's it's so easy these days to get lost in the flood of information and and media and all that constant. Uh, attention can just drain your your energy and if you don't have that direction and it's just distraction focus on your time then yeah then you're just all over the place and you're going to end up having i think problems that you don't know why you have if you and, and especially if you don't take care of yourself on top of that yep then you end up with all these health problems that you know it's very sedentary <laughs> Um, oh, I saw a study a few years ago just of what 
sitting down at your desk for eight hours does to your body over the long right. term. I mean, just that mm -hmm. is terrifying <laughs> when you mm -hmm. look at that. So right. it's like, I think it's something like if you stand up for five minutes every hour or something, like you reduce your chances of a heart attack by like 80 something percent. Like, don't quote me mm -hmm. on that stat, but it's something yeah. stupid. Like really? really just standing up and it's like, yeah, that's how bad just sitting for eight hours is for you. So yeah, we were meant to move a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to take a step back and really look at where you are in the, in the modern world and what your habits are every day, how you're spending your time. Cause it, it can be, you know, it can be something that helps you your, your daily rituals or, or something that, becomes like your your worst enemy and your biggest time suck and you have bad habits that take up all your time it's true actually it's so easy to go one way or the other <laughs> so if you want i can tell you a little bit about my ted talk because it's actually kind of relevant oh, yeah. to that do you want me to, I, oh, really? I don't think i ended up answering part of your question that you asked earlier one of my little tired okay. um yeah, so i landed my ted talk totally on accident um basically what ended up happening was Last year, I did an experiment on myself for 90 days and I posted a little bit about it on LinkedIn. I kept a daily vlog about it on TikTok because I don't normally post on TikTok and it was weird. And I was like, I don't want my normal friends to see this. Everybody's going to think I'm a wacko because I don't know how this is going to work out. Um, so what ended up happening is I did that. Didn't get like a huge viral following, but I got some pretty consistent you know, people that were following a couple hundred. And at the end of it, I had a friend tell me, they're like, man, that would make a great TED talk. And I was like, oh yeah, maybe it would. Well, <laughs> rewind 12 months before, I had taken, when I quit um, my job, I did not do anything for a year. I did no selling, nothing like that because nobody knew me as a coach. I was in sales. I had no branding as a coach because the jobs that I had at the time, even though I'd been doing it for five years, uh, I wasn't allowed to have a side hustle without disclosing it. And I was like, screw you guys. You don't need to know about what I do in my spare time. So <laughs> yeah, I just didn't tell them. So I could never advertise it. So what I did is I, I took three months off when I quit, did absolutely nothing, just kind of decompressed from 14 years of what sales does to you. And then from there, I just started building my brand, learning new skills, you know, sound, lighting, different things like that. So I can be on awesome podcasts like yours and not have it suck. Um, <laughs> And one of the things that I knew I wanted to do was get into public speaking and specifically paid public speaking gigs. So I went through uh, the speaker lab, great course. If anybody's ever looking for that, highly recommend them. I uh, went mm -hmm. through the speaker lab and did my training, got my talk done, different things like that. Well, then after I did this experiment, three months after I was done with that, um, when my friend recommended to try to the TED talk, I was like, yeah, let me just that would be good practice. It's a TED talk, you know, like, yeah, it's just a little eight, 10 minute thing. I had no idea what went into a TED talk. So I applied for one, found one that was actually in my city in Gainesville. I applied for it and long story short, ended up getting in. And what I found out after I got accepted was that TED talks are incredibly competitive. The average TED talk accepts less than a half of a percentage of the, um, of the applicants that they get. And mm -hmm. I was like, I live in Gainesville, Florida. I'm not in like Chicago or New York. Like how many people from Gainesville are trying to do a TED talk? And what I did not realize, and I'm saying this because I know a lot of people are usually interested in TED talks. So I'm kind of trying to give a little bit of the process. People will fly literally from all over the world to any location for a TED talk. So <laughs> it doesn't matter what TED talk you apply to, mm -hmm. even if it's Gainesville, Florida, we had hundreds and hundreds of applicants. And we had people coming from Peru, California, New York, all over the place. And they try to do make sure they get a couple mm -hmm. people locally. But at the end of the day, it's all about whatever the theme of that TED Talk is. So talk about branding. With they it. really know how to do branding, huh? <laughs> what was it? I said, talk about branding. They really know how to do branding. They totally do. And that's why people want a TED Talk. Because if you are getting into the public speaking game, to be able to say, I did a TED Talk, carries a lot of weight, carries a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. So that's why everybody and their mother wants to do a TED talk. So it's extremely right. competitive. So just a little tip for people, you know, having gone through it, what I would say is that whenever you're looking to do a TED talk, number one, there's normally a point system assigned to who they're evaluating. 
Number one, it is good to get one local to your state. You do get a point for being local. The second thing that I would say is that a lot of TED Talks have themes. So like the theme from the one that I was doing was intention. So what I did is I wrote my essay on what I wanted to talk about with their theme in mind and why it aligned with intention so well. And then the next thing that you want to do is just do your best to build a relationship with the local person, whoever's the organizer, um, you know, and, and just, you know, offer to help if you can, whatever the case is, if it's local, if you can do whatever, little things like that. It, don't get huge points for that on the official scale, but I know it helps, you know, on the human element. So, so yeah, so that's, um, the, you know, I offered to help bring in some sponsors. I was like, Hey, I know some people who could help sponsor us locally. You know, that wasn't the reason I got accepted, but I'm sure it didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's just a little side tangent there, but going back to the mindset thing, um, and talking about this, what my Ted talk was about and what my experiment was about is using alter egos to overcome challenges. And the, basically the TED Talk broke down into three things because this is a little bit of a weird topic, right? First off, it's what is, what is an alter ego? What an alter ego is not? And then the results of my experiment. So mm -hmm. to break it down very quickly, um, what an alter ego is, is or, or what an alter ego is not, is a fake version of you. A lot of times people will think that I'm manufacturing something about me and it's not really me. That is not what an alter ego is. Okay. That is just you making up <laughs> a persona, basically. Mm -hmm. What alter ego actually is, is a, um, uh, the way that they define it is a certain uh, focus on characteristics about you in order to help you to succeed in a particular field. And a field mm -hmm. is, you know, whatever it is you're doing. So like, you know, okay. do you yeah. have kids, for instance? Not me, no. No, you don't have kids. Okay. Uh, are, are you married or do you have a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, anything like that? Not single at the moment. Single at the moment. Okay. Um, so perfect. Not helping me out here, man. Okay. It, it, <laughs> so do, you know, whenever you're hanging with your friends, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so when you're hanging with your friends, do you act the same with your friends that you do with your work clients? Yeah, you can't really. <laughs> right. So are you being fake with your clients or are you being fake with your friends? Right. They're just different parts of you then. Exactly. So that's where a lot of people get mm -hmm. it confused. It's like, listen, you're being you. You're not being fake. You're just accentuating mm -hmm. certain characteristics about yourself to help you be a better professional, to help you be a better friend. Right. So mm -hmm. that's what an alter ego does. It's a, it's a psychological shift that we can make quickly to enable us to start tapping into certain characteristics. So when I'm playing with my kids, it's very different than when I'm working with clients, you know, now the way that you go about this and we all have alter egos, whether we recognize it or not, some people if they're listening to this, they're going, oh yeah, actually yeah, I do get it. Like there's work me, there's whole me, whatever. But this is what my experiment was about. We all struggle with challenges. There's all things that we want to do. Like what you were saying, you were talking about like fitness and like trying to stay in shape. So you don't have to worry about later on in life and things like that. Well, one of the challenges that we can run into is the fact that we just don't want to do it because <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Yeah. Making changes is hard. If you're an entrepreneur, there's something in your business. Like for me, I, 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 you know, it's just me right now. I have a virtual assistant, but outside of that, it's just me. There's things I just don't want to do, but there's nobody else to do it. So guess what? I got to do it or the business is going to suffer. The thing that can be a nice mental hack to help you want to do it is to intentionally create an alter ego around that thing. Mm. So what my experiment was, is I hate running really hate it. Okay. Unless it involves a ball. Like if we're playing football or basketball or something, then I'll run all day. But to run, mm -hmm. just to run, we domesticated horses 5,500 years ago. So we didn't have to run anymore. The majority of human civilization has been centered around finding new ways to not have to run. Right. I mean, we even invented those little shoes that have wheels in them. So you can just skate around. Like, we just don't like running. My wife is a runner. She's a psychopath. I don't know what's wrong with her. <laughs> but the point is, I said, I am going to use an alter ego 
to see if I can teach myself to learn to love to run, something I have hated my entire life. Because if I can learn to do something I don't want to do, how much more effective will this be for somebody who actually wants to do something? And the long story short is, at, I said, I'm going to give it 90 days. I have no goals. I created an alter ego, what I call super alter ego, and I gave him a name. So my alter ego's name is Hotshot. <laughs> and I use something called a totem and a totem is either some type of hand motion or a physical object that you use as a trigger to switch to that alter ego quickly. So for me, it was sunglasses. <laughs> I live in Florida, right? I need sunglasses when I'm running. So when I put on these sunglasses, I channeled this new persona and this new persona loved running. Hotshot was the best way to describe it, me on a shot of tequila and two Red Bulls and just a boost of energy, a little loose and loved running. And that was hot shot. And I also was waking up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm a night owl. I'm not a morning person. And I just said, I'm just going to do this for 90 days. And the short version of this is that after 30 days, hot shot kind of channeling him wasn't even necessary anymore. I was wanting, my mindset had started to shift. I started enjoying running. You know, oh, by the way, I started this experiment in August in Florida when there's a ton of bugs out that fly into your mouth when you're running and it's <laughs> ungodly hot and ungodly wet. It, literally the most miserable month to start running. So <laughs> I stacked the cards against me and it worked. So nice. for people out there in business, in your personal life, what I would say is that if you want to do something, if you want to make a positive change in your life, an alter ego is a great way to do it. Figure yeah. out the characteristics you need in order to channel that. And mm -hmm. then if you, there's, there's two different things that you can do. If you want to create a super alter ego like I did, to where you give it a name and characteristics around it, that's an incredibly effective way to do it. And there's a lot of experiments and science behind all this. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to go that far, the simplest thing that you can do is refer to yourself in the third person. So if there's something you don't want to do, if you just say, Carl does not want to do this today. All right. Carl does not want to make his launch today. Carl wants to eat out. <laughs> By just referring to yourself in the third person, what you are doing is creating dissonance from your immediate emotions and normal habits that you would make. And right. by doing yeah. that and removing yourself from your initial, you know, just go to behavior, mm -hmm. you give yourself the opportunity to think differently and to look mm -hmm. at it from a new perspective. And that's mm -hmm. really yeah. one Makes of the sense. biggest powers of the alter ego. Right. Right. So it's I know it's a little like, weird, but find yourself. It's like, what would what would that guy do? <laughs> <laughs> that is an alter ego. I actually mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. that yeah. uh, it, in the TED talk. Yeah. So, you know, even channeling and thinking what somebody else would do. And the thing is, we think for people who think this is a little weird, think about it like this. We see alter egos in public all the time. Beyonce, she is incredibly no well known by her fans by Sasha Fierce. Sasha Fierce was an alter ego she created because she had stage fright in the, be in the beginning of her career. Mm -hmm. Beyonce, of all people, had stage fright. Mm -hmm. You know, Kobe Bryant, the Black Mamba. He used to talk about it all the time when he stepped onto the court and channeled that Mamba mentality. He became a killer. It just totally different mentality. So we see it in famous people all the time. Sometimes they'll even tell you what the name of it is. Another popular one right now is David Goggins. David Goggins, freak athlete, former Navy SEAL. And he has David Goggins and he has Goggins. <laughs> and, 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 and David Goggins is the, you know, 290 pound fat guy who loves donuts and all these other things. And Goggins is the world-class Navy SEAL endurance athlete, and they are constantly at war with each other. So right. it's, um, it's an interesting dichotomy, but like I said, it works. There's real science behind it. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a great, a great thing to think about. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> so, um, I, I wonder what is um, happening in your your coaching right now. What are you What are you most excited about, and and what's coming up in this year? No, that's a great question. I haven't been asked that one recently. So, 
just started the mastermind. So that is um, basically what I do is I have a system going back to the strategy thing we talked about. There's seven steps. And the thing that I'm actually going to use other people's words because I've actually heard this a lot. And, you know, this is a, a key differentiator, I would say, with me compared to other coaches. There's a lot of good coaches out there, whether they're life coaches, executive coaches, whatever the case may be. Tony Robbins, you know, all these other Dean Graziosi's of the world, they're all doing these masterminds. Mm -hmm. I've done some of those. They're great. They deal with a lot of stuff. But the thing that I found lacking in a lot of them that I needed was a lot of them are actually dealing with the mindset element primarily they're they're focused on that not locking down your purpose whatever the case may be all that stuff was super helpful we've talked about how important that is i dive into that a little bit at the beginning but the majority of mine is actually focused on super tactical things because what i found is i would go to a lot of these i've heard tony robbins speak i've heard a lot of these other guys you know, in women speak that, and it's like, man, I'm motivated. I feel like I have some clarity, but then after they're done with the program or the talk or whatever, it's like, what next? Like I need, like, how do I functionally take action on this? And mm -hmm. that's what I found was lacking. Mm -hmm. So that's where the strategy stuff really kind of came into play in these seven steps. And that's what people tell me is different about mine compared to others. It's not that it's better. It's just different. And, um, well, it might be better than some, there's some crappy ones out there, we'll call it what it is, but, uh, but you know, mine really focuses on, you know, you put into the system, what you want to get, you go through the process, ask you a bunch of questions, a couple tools, to help you figure some things out. And then, you know, it gives you a very tactical plan of like, this is where I want to be in three years. And this is what I have to do today to make a tiny step forward to that goal. And then we bridge that gap with a plan that feels real and, and, and feasible. So that's the thing I've been excited about is just seeing the results of that, of people coming in, not doing it one-on-one, -on -one, doing it in a group format um, because I hadn't done the group format before, seeing the fact that I don't have to be the one that knows everything. You know, I screen people that are coming in uh, mm -hmm. to make sure they're a good fit for the group. And there, people learn so much from each other you know, it's, it's awesome. So I think that, um, that's been one thing that's really exciting is, is not just seeing the program work, but then seeing people learn from other people in their walk of life and their level of expertise that I don't have, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all of us kind of contributing to that level of success of whoever it is we're focused on. Um, that's been one really exciting thing. And then as far as where things are going in 2025, I have two big things that I'm, I'm two big changes that I'm making and they're not really changes they're add-ons I should say. So mm -hmm. the first level is lifestyle design. And that is really centered around three questions. What do you want? Why do you want it? And how are you going to get it? That's what we're trying to figure out. We're going to build a strategy for the life that you want. And then we're going to start executing on it. The next part of that, in my opinion, that plays really naturally into this is personal branding. What is your personal brand? Because when I'm working with entrepreneurs, business leaders, and salespeople, your personal brand has real monetary um, impacts on multiple different things. And there's a lot of different ways to monetize or improve your career through having a strong and defined personal brand. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, you know, a lot of it has to do with making money, but there's also attracting talent, attracting opportunities, whatever the case may be, to where this benefits you. And it can play out in a lot of different ways. You know, for me, it's coming in the, the sense of people, you know, I get inbound leads for my business, so I don't have to go out and search for business as much. I'm starting to get speaking gigs. I'm doing my next big speaking gig at the end of this month at Totality uh, Sales Conference. I'm excited about that. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that this starts to manifest itself when you have a defined personal brand. And a lot of people, I know I used to think this way, they think of a personal brand as like your reputation. It's like, well, that's, it's kind of my professional reputation. I would disagree with that. That's definitely part of it, but your personal reputation is really just self-focused. Rory Vaden uh, is the CEO of Brand Builders. And he said this, and I love this. He goes, what a personal brand should be is not so much self-focused, but others focused. And he says that your personal brand should let other people know how you can serve them. And I, I always love that. So I'm going to be starting a personal branding cohort next year. 
And then we're going to start doing a couple live events as well. I, I love doing the Zoom stuff, mm-hmm. but I like meeting with people in person too. So those yeah. are the two big changes coming next year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're down there in vacation land. You might as well right. use your advantage. <laughs> it's not hard to get people to come to Florida. You know, I've got some good <laughs> yeah. places that I can, I can pick. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cool. So if, if someone wants to get a hold of you, um, is, is LinkedIn the, the best place or um, where do you hang out usually? Yeah, LinkedIn. Uh, you can type in my name. I'm there. I post almost every day. Um, okay. I don't do a lot of social media. I love LinkedIn because I feel like it's not the LinkedIn of four years ago where people just put out their resumes. There's some mm-hmm. really amazing content creators on there that give real mm-hmm. actionable advice. I try to be one of them. Um, you know, I've had people who aren't in my mastermind talk to me about how some of the freebies I give away and other things have made such a huge impact on them. And I I love that. It's like, I don't want to just help people that are in my mastermind. I love the fact that my content can help others that aren't in it. So hopefully, you know, others will experience that too, but LinkedIn. And then, um, if you go to my website, course and solutions.com, I can give you the link to put in the show notes. Uh, one thing I encourage people to go there for is I have a tab up at the top called free resources and I am continually making things that are a part of my mastermind. It's just a piece of it um, that I want anybody to be able to use. So I give a lot of those things away for free. I have a podcast, I have a YouTube channel. I do a lot of very you know specific walkthroughs on stuff. Um, so all that's under the free resources tab. I write articles. So if anybody likes free stuff that can help them build wealth, uh, it's a good place to find that. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to talk with me today. I, I hope we can catch up again soon. You know, absolutely. This has been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, um, you know, and when you, uh, when you walk with purpose, you collide with destiny, I think I like to tell people. So <laughs> I love that. It's very true. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time today, Stephen. Um, and, and have a good week. All right. You too, Carl. Stay in touch. Again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye.